Good morning and happy Sabbath. This is our second service here at the Campion Seventh-day Adventist Church. Want to give you a warm welcome. And for those of you who are tuning online, welcome to you as well. For those of you who are attending for the very first time, we want to get to know you. There is a Connect card in the pew in front of you, either here or those who are in the balcony. And for those of you who are online, you can text us at 970-279-3432. We would like to get to know you. If you have any questions, you can ask them to the pastors. They'll respond. And we have a gift for you. We have a special gift for those of you who are attending for the very first time. So come see one of us, and we will get you hooked up with that special gift. Today is a high Sabbath because not only is it Sabbath, and every Sabbath is high, is a high Sabbath for us, but today is the very first annual conference of the West Central Young Adults, and this team of young people, I am just absolutely uh, overwhelmed with their, their passion and their desire for Jesus Christ. Uh, about a year ago or so, some, some of the young people came back from a conference, and they decided that they wanted to form a team, form a group here in the Mid-America uh, area that would encourage young people to get in their churches and get things going for outreach and, and missions and, and just do the work in these last days. And it actually took off quite quickly. We called around, uh, lots of young people came, and before you knew it, we had chosen a president, a vice president, a secretary, and the list goes down. And then they spent last year, during, during the COVID year, the lockdown, they spent last year going church to church doing doing ministry, some churches, we had people, some churches, it was empty, and we were just talking to a camera, but they continued on. They've done some services for our schools, for the firemen, for, uh, for pastors, and this is the very first conference that they have put together, and I am just so proud of each one of them. My name is Alex Rodriguez. I'm, I'm a pastor with the Voice of Prophecy, and they, they just, uh, you know, just uh, to humor me, I don't know, or just, you know, just because they, they liked me a little bit, I don't know. They, anyway, they asked me if I'd be one of their advisors, and it has been been a blessing, more of a blessing to me, I think, than I have been a blessing to them, but it's exciting to be part of the team. Uh, Pastor Getz is, is uh, with me next, uh, and he is also part of the team, so I'll pass the mic to him. Take it away. Um, my mic isn't on. There we go. Um, good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Amelia, Amelia Zerman. I am the communications director, and I'm privileged to be a part of this team. You know, I thought I'd be the last one but it turns out because I had the microphone, I was the first. Um, but it's a blessing to be here, and i um, excited to worship with you all this Sabbath. Morning, everyone. My name is Mindy Schumacher. Um, I'm from North Dakota, and I'm the president. So we are super blessed to be here with all of you, and just can't wait to worship again. Um, hopefully you've been joining us throughout the weekend, um, and you'll join us again at 3 this afternoon. But just so blessed to be here with you all, and thanks for having us. Happy Sabbath. My name is Siki Fredo Carrera. I live here in Loveland, and I'm excited to, ha uh, to be here with all of you and be able to worship together. Um, God is good. Happy Sabbath. My name is Chase Rodriguez. I am the director of missions. I live down the road, uh, 50 minutes or so, and super excited to be here. Happy Sabbath, everybody. My name is Bailey Graybill, and I am the music coordinator. And I'm from a little town just 30 minutes east of here, um, but right now I'm attending Weimar College in California. So I'm very thankful that I was able to be here. Happy Sabbath, everyone. My name is Kenny Orr. I'm the programming director for the West Central Young Adults, and I'm from Denver. with us. Um, Shiloh Howard is our secretary. Uh, Weston Brown is our logistics coordinator. Uh, Jake Graybill isn't here with us this morning, but he is our evangelism coordinator. And Samantha McDaniel is our prayer coordinator. So those are the rest of our team that can't be here with us today, but they send greetings. The reason we wanted to introduce them was because maybe you know some young adults, and thank you those who are going to sit down. Maybe there's some young adults that you know of that you're saying, hey, is there anything going on? Here's a group from, from the greater Colorado area, all the way up to the Dakotas and beyond, that are saying, we want to make a difference with young adults in our, in our area. And so connect, get connected with this group, West Central Young Adults. We have three, three things for us to know about three going-ons that you must know about. Number one, 
Pastor D. Casper is here, director of mission school there in Pennsylvania. He is doing a presentation this afternoon. He'll preach, of course, for this service, 3 o'clock. And then tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., there's just more of a classroom style. Let's talk about soul winning and be trained for that. That would be here at the church, and you'd be welcome to, do, to uh, join in. Number two, there is a cooking class, school class. If you're scared of either one of those terms, it's a cooking party that's happening at th on Thursday at 6.30. Uh, Renee Cleveland is going to take us with a plant-based, gluten-free illustration. Number three, come next Friday. Next weekend, you just, whatever's going on next weekend, you got to rope it off. You got to postpone it, cancel it. Next weekend, next Friday night, we will begin a prayer weekend with an hour of prayer here and then in the morning, Sabbath morning, in the afternoon as well. At three to five, it's going to be a busy time. You can't have anything else going on because from three to five, there'll be a prayer group that meets here at the church, and then there will be outreach groups that go out. Who are the outreach groups? It's us. We're going to go out, connect with shut-ins, connect with people in our community that we can invite to the Easter Resurrection Weekend programming the following weekend. So next Sabbath afternoon, three to five, this is where you'll want to be. God bless you. God bless us as we worship before his throne this morning. I invite you to please stand with us as we sing our opening hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. It's great to see you here today. Here at Campion, we have a mission statement, a model. Each one, we long for each one to reach one. And what better way to accomplish that mission than launching into our spring semester of grow groups. We have 26 grow groups. You have a catalog in your bulletin. If you don't have a catalog, you can see it on the table on your way out. We have these opportunities for you to get connected in a grow group, in a small circle this semester. And out of our 26, we have one. Johnny, tell us a little bit about your grow group. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my wife and I, Josephine, uh, we work in a secular environment. And you know, we've just been talking a, a lot, uh, especially the last year, you know, how we can go out 
and share when sometimes working in that kind of, kind, kind of environment, it's not welcome or you just don't have the opportunity to you know, witness in the, you know, I guess the normal sense of witness you know, for, for us to, And so we want to have this grow group where we can, uh, you know, just talk through different ways that you've uh, maybe done so in your work environment to, to share the gospel, uh, just to share as a group and to, you know, discuss and, and be able to uh, create ideas that we can, you know, be out there in the workplace and still, you know, share the gospel, the news, uh, good news of Jesus. Um, so uh, it's 8.30 Thursday nights. Uh, it might be a little bit late for some, but, you know, if you have kids, uh, it's definitely a, the best time after the kids go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're ready to talk. That's true. Yeah. So why, so in one sentence, why should someone sign up? Well, you want to sign up because this is a group that, uh, you know, to form a community, uh, sometimes you, you might be, you might feel left out being out there by yourself, working in a secular environment. We're here for your support as well. So come and join us on Thursday nights at 8.30. That's awesome. So how do you sign up? Well, there are several ways. If you're watching with us online, you can go to our bulletin online and sign up with the link there. If you are here, you can pull out your your bulletin or even this catalog and just scan that QR code. Now you might be thinking, I'm not digitally savvy. I don't know what a QR code is. That's okay. If you're here, you can come to our grow group tables here right behind these doors and also in our connect center and sign up with pen and paper. We want you to be a part of a, gro a group because I really believe, we really believe that the, be the best way that we can grow together is when we actually grow together. And this semester, we have something special. We're encouraging our grow groups to fill empty chairs, pray for, for an empty seat for a non-member, someone who's not connected to our church, because we really believe that these grow groups are the best evangelistic missional tools. So sign up today. Talk to me. Talk to Johnny on your way out. God bless, and I thank you in advance for signing up. Now it's time for the children's story. Please... Um, all the children can come up now. When you come up, watch out for the butterfly nuts and keep your distance as you sit here. Welcome to the front, guys. I have a question for you. Does any of you know what my friend is here? Yep, we hear it right here. These boys said it's a sheep. And this sheep's name is Shrek. Our story is going to be about Shrek. Before we talk about Shrek, we're going to learn three fun facts about sheep. So the first one is when a sheep is standing and looking straight forward, they can see. 200, 270 degrees 
And so that means when they're standing and looking forwards, they can see everything over here and over here. So when you walk up on them, they can see you a lot of times way back here. So they have a much bigger field of vision than we do. So that's pretty cool, huh? The next thing that's really unique about sheep is that they don't just smell with their nose. They also smell with their eyes and their feet. Isn't that crazy? They have the ability to smell in scent glands that are in their eyes and on the bottom of their feet. So they can smell way better than us. And also, have you guys seen a sheep before in person? How many of you have seen a sheep in person before? We have a few. So they have their top lip has a split right down the middle because they're very picky eaters. They want to eat only the best. And so when they eat, they use their lips. And we used to have sheep, so I would watch them. It was the craziest thing. They would nibble, and they would eat, and they could pick what they wanted to eat. And they didn't have to eat everything because if they didn't like it, they would just kick it out that slit in their, in their lip, and they wouldn't have to chew it off with the rest of the stuff. Pretty crazy, huh? So we're going to learn a little bit about sheep. Do you guys know that the Bible likens us to sheep? We're called, like, sheep and lambs. And who is the shepherd? Jesus is the shepherd. So our story is about Shrek. So this is like Shrek. He was a sheep that was lost in a cave for over six years. So he never, he disappeared from his shepherd, and the shepherd never found him for six years. So what do you think happened when he came back? They usually get their hair or their wool cut off every year. So he was huge. He was just like a round ball, just tons and tons of wool. And when they sheared him, the wool weighed 60 pounds. That's quite a bit. Normally, when you shear sheep, they weigh under 10 pounds, the wool that you get off. So almost six times more weight he was carrying around for six years. Um, so the, the wool that they took off of him was enough to make 20 suits. So does your daddy wear a suit? They could have made 20 of his suits with the wool that they got off of him. So that's a lot of wool. But he was hiding from his shepherd for so long, and he was accumulating all this weight that he wouldn't have had to carry. And it just reminds us of our relationship with Jesus. Jesus always wants us to come to him, and he always encourages us to come to him because he promises that he can take our burdens and that he will give us his burdens, which is light. So I just want you to remember to always seek Jesus because he will always take care of you. You can go back to your seats. Yes, it is true, Christ is the Good Shepherd, but also his word says that he is the Lamb of God, and it is only by his blood that we can be redeemed. So right now we're going to go ahead and sing Redeemed. Child and forever I 
love those last lines I'm just looking at on the screen here. His child and forever I am. Not just his child I am, that's forever. Uh, Kenny is going to come up and help us lead out in our theme song for this weekend. It's based off of our theme text in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. So I would invite you to stand with us. We're going to sing this through one time. I know uh, most of you probably don't know it yet. Uh, we'll sing through once, and then the next time I invite you uh, with some more confidence to join with us as we sing. Good morning and happy Sabbath. God has put a calling on our lives. You see, God came down, He saw the mess we were in, He died for us, and He asked that all we do is accept Him as our Lord and Savior. And then once we do that, to go out and tell the world, about how wonderful he is, and about how soon he is coming back. Well, we at West Central Young Adults decided that we wanted to help the churches get out there and tell the community about Jesus. So, we have put together an outreach project every single month for the next year. Now, these projects consist of uh, some things like uh, homeless bags or maybe uh, glow tracks, passing them out. But we've put together these uh, outreach projects and they're specifically designed for you and your church to get out there in the community and help out and tell people about God. Now, if you go to our website at wcyoungadults.org, 
we're going to be putting training videos every single month up on the website. And these training videos will uh, be instructional as to how to do this or that or the other. So head to the website and check those out every single month. Now, this afternoon at 2 p.m., we are starting the very first outreach project for this month. So we're going to be putting together homeless bags over in the HMS gym. We're going to be trying to put together at least 2,000 bags. Now, here's the deal. We only have 45 minutes to do this. And that's not very long for that amount of bags. So we need as many as you that can come out and help to go over at the HMS gym at 2 p.m. Now, let's say that you say, oh man, but church gets out so late, then I gotta go eat, and by the time I eat, there's not enough time to get over there. Well, I've got good news for you. We have a meal prepared just for you. So if you're willing to stay and help put bags together, then we've got a lunch prepared for you right over in the kitchen uh, of the church. So hope to see you over at the HMS gym at 2 p.m. We're going to sing a prayer song now, and after the prayer song, I'd invite you to kneel and bring your burdens to Jesus. to kneel with me, please. Father in heaven, we're kneeling before you today, and we want to acknowledge that you are our Lord and Savior, and that you are absolutely amazing. It's hard to even fathom, you can't even imagine how you came down and you died for us. And like was mentioned in the panel Sabbath school this morning, that he couldn't see through the future at that point, and he didn't know that he was going to be resurrected, but he was willing to die and end his life completely and not even be able to see the people he was saving afterwards just so that we can go and spend eternity in heaven. So thank you so much for that and what you've done for us. Uh, some people come to mind as uh, I'm kneeling here, and I'm sure on many people's hearts, uh, people come to mind and, you know, they're struggling with, you know, sickness or sorrows, the loss of a loved one maybe. And you have promised, Lord, that because you died for us and uh, because you're giving us grace, that if we say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior, and I want you to be in my life, that all sickness, all sorrows, all disease, all issues will be forever done away with, and we will live a extremely wonderful life with you in heaven. Thank you for uh, continuing to always be with us and with us every step of the way. Uh, please... Uh, help us with this calling that you put on our hearts to go out and tell people about your soon and very soon coming. Please be with Pastor D. Casper as he brings us a message this morning. And please be with the words that he speaks, not be his, but your words, and help them to be a blessing to us here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Um, I am here to introduce our speaker today. His name is Dee Casper. Uh, he's the director of the Core Evangelism Training Program. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Uh, ever since 2010, when he was baptized, he's been working in ministry. Uh, he has served as a Bible worker, been a Bible teacher in the academy setting, and has taught in different schools of evangelism. He definitely loves to invest in the youth, and uh, thank you for investing in us. Uh, and I present the Casper. Gracias, hermano. Thank you for that. I'm really awkward with introductions and biographies and stuff. I'm a white boy from the Midwest. That's all you really need to know. I'm a really simple dude. Um, so thank you for that. I would like to begin with a word of prayer. What you see in the bulletin is no longer true, but that is only my fault and not whoever labored over printing them. So we'll be covering this afternoon's thing this morning, and we'll cover this morning's thing this afternoon. Uh, for It'll help me arrange my time a little bit better. So this morning's message is entitled, The Greatest Commission. The Greatest Commission. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, thank you that I believe you've been good to us so far through the course of this week. Um, we thank you for the beautiful music we've heard. Those girls sang such a lovely song. And I just pray now that you would be present, that you would speak to us, and that you would help us to understand your intention and awaken us to the reality of the call you have on each of us individually. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. The Greatest Commission. We're going to be talking about discipleship this morning and the importance of discipleship. Uh, I'm so stoked to hear that you guys are doing grow groups here and investing in your community in the ways that you are. That is awesome, and I'm glad to hear that. So the goal of a disciple, uh, in John chapter 17 and verse 3, Jesus says, and this is eternal. I'm just curious, how big is that on the board? Can you actually read that from where you are? All right, I did it at least. I, I did think of you, but it may not have been the best size-wise. Anyway. Uh, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So Jesus defines eternal life as an experience to truly know God, not this intellectual head knowledge, to experientially know God for yourself. So our goal as a disciple of Jesus and for the people that we ourselves disciple is eternal life. That's what we're shooting for, right? That's the metric. That's the goal. 
And eternal life is found in a genuine, heartfelt surrender to Jesus Christ. And when you surrender to His love and encounter His love and live entirely for Him. So that means then that eternal life actually begins here and not in heaven. Did you know that? You don't have to wait to pass those pearly gates to begin to enjoy the glories of heaven. That begins in the here and now. You can know and believe the love that God has for you, First John tells us. So what makes heaven heaven is secure eternal fellowship with Jesus Christ and with the Father, not the scenery. To be honest with you, I could care less what it looks like. Um, sometimes those conversations kind of drive me bonkers, like, I wonder what it's going to look like. Will my dog be there? Will all these things. And like at the end of the day, what makes heaven heaven to me is I can bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus. I can wrap my arms around his legs, and I never have to let him go. I never have to wonder if I'm good enough. I'm home. That's what makes heaven heaven to me, and that process begins here. So we need a paradigm shift, right? When you, and this happens uh, when we encounter the love of God, that we realize that we should stop thinking only of ourselves. Like if God thinks that highly of me, as we talked about in our first service, if he would pay that much and think that highly of me, then the least thing that I can do is recognize that he places that same value on the people around me, that they also have the same need that I need of eternal life and that uh, they can also have that security as well. So we will find a love awakening inside of us for the people in our sphere of influence that wasn't there before, that when you encounter the true love of Jesus that sweeps you off your feet, you don't just think about you. <laughs> you recognize other people need what I have found. And your concern and your desire for their well-being only grows in the Christian journey. The closer we grow to Jesus, the closer we also will grow in our understanding of the needs of the people around us. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 13 and 15, that greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. It's a heavy price, isn't it? But you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. To be a friend of Jesus, what a privilege is that? For all things that I heard from my Father, I've made known to you. So here's our calling. We're a friend of Jesus and a friend for Jesus. Right? When we become a child of God and even a friend of God, He places love in our hearts for those around us, and it grows to the point that we would be willing to lay down our lives for the benefit of another. So it changes our whole worldview, and it will lead us to a good kind of death. Jesus died to show us our own need of dying and to realize what the fruit of our selfishness really is. And Jesus is wanting us to realize that we exist for greater reasons than just fulfilling our own wants and desires. We exist to be used by God in service to others. And George Mueller is a tremendous example of this. Um, I know that Wikipedia is not a scholarly source, and I've never cited it in a sermon except for today. So, but this is kind of a brief biography of George Mueller. It was quick, okay? It says, George Mueller was well known for providing an education to the children under his care to the point where he was accused of raising the poor above their natural station in life. Now, that's an accusation I could roll with, amen? <laughs> he was accused of raising the poor above their natural station in life. He also established 117 schools which offered Christian education to over 120,000 children many of them being orphans. It's such a powerful life story. Would to God that I could have that type of impact in this life. So he was asked a question, why were you so successful? And this is what he says, there's a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have only to show myself approved to God. Amen? A good kind of death. And he's, this is what he says. He says, the child of God must be willing to be a channel through which God's bounties flow, both with regards to temporal and spiritual things. This channel is narrow and shallow at first it may be, yet there is room for some of the waters of God's bounty to pass through. And if we cheerfully yield ourselves as channels for this purpose, then the channel becomes wider and deeper, and the waters of the bounty of God can pass through more abundantly. Amen? So when we choose to give of ourselves in service for others, when we're awakened to the reality that we aren't to live for ourselves, that's not why you're here. 
that when we do that, the more we do it, the more we want to do it. And like this good kind of erosion, that channel grows deeper and wider as the channels of God's blessings flow through us. And he's called us to the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about this. This is a powerful and amazing chapter. And so we'll read it at you know, a handful of verses from here. Beginning of verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ compels us. It consumes us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. And here's why Jesus died, he says. That those who live should no longer live for themselves. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Jesus died so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And so therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't look at people based upon what we can get out of them. We look at them based upon what we can do for them. Are you with me this morning? This is what the gospel transaction does to us. It awakens us to that reality. And he says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Many times our ambitions or our desires to reach out to Jesus initially are selfish in nature. And Jesus is so awesome that he says, I'll take it. And then he begins a process of transforming even our desires for seeking him because we desire to know him, not just get away from the problems of our experience, though he's glad to help with those. You understanding? Our desire for Jesus and for heaven becomes something that's so much more God-centered and not just me-centered. He continues in verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And now all things are of God who's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Right? God was in Jesus drawing the world to himself. Not imputing, not crediting their trespasses to them. And he's committed to you and I the ministry of reconciliation. So now then... We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us and we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you're wondering this morning, what is the purpose of my life? Why am I here? What does God want from me? God has called every single one of you to be ministers of reconciliation. That's your calling. We've been reconciled to God through Christ God is working through Jesus to reconcile the world to himself, and he's also working through humble instrumentalities like you and me to do the same thing. And what a privilege that is. It's an amazing privilege. For he made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, as we covered this morning. So, John talks about this multiple times in 1 John, that, you know, believe and do what you've heard from the beginning. And 1 John 3.11 says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he's referring to what Jesus says here in John 13.34, a new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another as I have loved you. Oh, snap, that's different, right? <laughs> Loving one another, I'll do my best, Jesus, but he doesn't stop there. He says, I want you to love others as I have loved you. Well, in John chapter 13, we're told that having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He did not consider his life so precious that he would keep it to himself. He poured it out completely for the benefit of us. That's a high calling, isn't it? But the good news is, He's not asking you with your selfish, carnal heart to love others in that way. He's asking us to receive his unselfish heart of love. Amen? In every command that Jesus gives is the power to walk in that command. There is creative power in his word. So when he's telling us to go forth and love people as he has loved us, that means he's willing to empower you and to enable you to love others as he has loved you. Amen? That's good news that you also love one another, and by this we'll all know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, right? If we'll get over our petty differences and choose to lift and to esteem each other better than oneself, the world will recognize there's something different about these people. They've been with Jesus. So how did Jesus love us? Again, in Ephesians, uh, well, actually, we'll do this one real quick. In Ephesians chapter 5, 
what basically just alludes to this effect, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for her. And in Titus 2, it talks about the fact that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. Uh, I lost it from there. First, he might redeem us. Uh, from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. He gave himself for us. That's what he's asking us to do, to give of ourselves for others. And in John chapter 13, he loved you to the end, in spite of what we've been, in spite of what we've done. And lastly, in John chapter 15 and verse 13, that he gave his life for us. John chapter 15 and verse 13. I'll grab this one real briefly. John chapter 15 and verse 13 says, Greater love is no one than this again than to lay down one's life for his friends. So true disciples of Jesus have love for one another as Jesus loves them, and they love God more than anything on earth. And the beautiful thing is, uh, we're told this in 1 John, that um, we love him because he first loved us. And this is good news because we're not just thinking like, man, well, how do I find love for God? By focusing on the love that God has for you. That's what we're told. We're told this in Desire of Ages, I believe, that only by love is love awakened. So if you find that you don't have a lot of love for God or for the people around you, the best thing you can do is saturate your life with the love of Jesus. Saturate your life with the love of God the Father for humanity. And as you do this, it'll change your life. Uh, my friend David Asherick is doing this thing now called DA with DA, doing, going through the Desire of Ages, a chapter a day for 90 days. And I did yesterday's episode with him on chapter 26, I believe. It's called At Capernaum. And after reading that chapter, Desire of Ages, and how compassionate and amazing Jesus was, I, found, I told David this yesterday in his living room, I said, David, I'm more in love with Jesus now than I was before I read that chapter. So if you're wondering, how do I find love for God, I would encourage you to read that book, right? Read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read Paul's epistles in Romans and 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Like, under, just immerse yourself in the undying love of Jesus, and you will find your heart strangely warmed. And in that process of finding a reciprocating love for God, you will also find that your perspective of the people around you is going to change. Those things that used to bother you about people, you start to realize, you know, there's probably a reason why they do that. I should give them the grace that I wish that they would give me when I don't have a good day. Are you understanding? This whole thing changes the life, guys. It's meant to do that. So Jesus is someone worth losing everything else for. And this is what leads us to the love of those around us and the love that will lead us to give our lives for our brethren. Like Jesus says the two greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. But I need to go into this because I don't hear people talk about this much. That's actually a really scary and, 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 and a heavy indictment because if I were to love others in the way that I love myself, I wouldn't be doing a lot of good deeds. Because I don't know about you, but I wrestle with self-hatred. Anyone else here have unhealthy thoughts about themselves? That I'm a loser, I'm not good enough, right? And so if, if we took Jesus at face value to love others as we love ourselves, the world may be worse than better at the end of the day. So we, again, need to be focusing on God's love for us and to be willing to receive his grace, to not let the walls of shame and self-hatred and so forth deny us access to the bounties of God's grace. And when you learn to love yourself, now you're going to be a safe person to minister to and invest in others. Does that make sense? Right? My therapist was just telling me, I started seeing therapists therapist like a year and a half, two years ago, And he said, like, you've spent the last year falling in love with yourself. And that sounds kind of vain and crazy and selfish initially, but when you've had the thought life of I've had and had the childhood that I had, that's a miracle, amen? (laughs) To learn to actually love and accept yourself is a blessing. So Peter thought that he loved Jesus this way. He heard what Jesus is saying. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. These other guys are total deadbeat losers, but I'll love you that way. Everybody else may leave you, but I won't. So Peter says to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for your sake. You're my friend. You're saying greater love is no one than this than to lay down their life for their friends. I got you, Jesus. But did it work out all that well for him? No. Right? He still valued his own life above the call that he was given. 
Are you also one of this man's disciples? Which implies that John confessed that he was a disciple of Jesus. And the denial of Jesus happens right in front of John, by the way. If you look at the text, he brings a servant girl to the door. She opens the door. She says, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And Peter says, uh, yeah, no. He thought he loved Jesus that way, but when the rubber really met the road and the real trials of life came, he realized, man, I got no game, son. I, I don't have it. And so in John 12, 24 to 26, Jesus says this, Most assuredly I say to you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and does what? Dies, how does it remain? Alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life, that goal that we're striving for as disciples and disciple makers. And he says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And so in John 21, Peter does eventually get it. Jesus comes up to him after they had the miraculous catch of fish, had their breakfast on the shore. He goes for a walk with Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter... Do you love me? And he uses the word agape here, which is a, it's a heavy, loaded word. It's this perfect, other-centered love. Do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I have weak human love for you. It's all I got, Jesus. Which already is a recognition that Peter's had a breaking moment. Peter has fallen upon the rock of Christ and has been broken. He has died to the old Peter. And he's recognizing his own limitations. Jesus asks him again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And he says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. And lastly, Jesus meets the man where he is. And I'm so thankful for this. He meets the man where he is. And he says, Peter, do you phileo me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter finally recognizes his nothingness. We're told this in the faith I live by 111. What is justification by faith? It's the work of God. The work of who? The work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. And when men see their nothingness, they're prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Peter didn't see his nothingness before, but you better believe he does now. Encountering his own failure in light of the cross broke this man. He died. And Jesus, through this reborn human being, does amazing and powerful things. And so you see that in Acts chapter 2. He preaches this powerful sermon. Clearly the seed died and bore much fruit. Amen? This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and the foundation you will need to make disciples for Jesus. This is a really interesting statement of Jesus in John chapter 17 that uh, at first glance is kind of strange. In John chapter 17 verses 4 and 5, Jesus is bearing his heart to the Father in prayer. And I'm so thankful he didn't go pray in a closet. Like he prayed openly and the disciples saw him wrestling with his Father and pleading with him for his disciples and those who would believe after them, uh, which is, you know, you and me and stuff. So he's praying in John 17 in verse 4 and 5, and he says, Father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And you kind of scratch your head and think, uh, yeah, this is before Calvary. So how can Jesus, I mean, I don't want to get political, but I don't want to put like a mission, mission accomplished banner on, behind us, but like, how is it that he's saying that the work is finished when he hasn't even died yet? He's finished the work that God gave him before Calvary. David Platt picks up on this. He's got an amazing book called Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. It's a big punch in the face for American Christianity, and honestly, we could use it. It's really, really good. He's not an Adventist, but it's an amazing resource. So he says this. He says, Jesus lived for them, talking about the disciples. He lived for them. During his earthly ministry, he spent more time with these 12 men than with everyone else in the world put together. And he makes this point in another place where anytime the crowds got kind of big, Jesus dismisses the crowd. He says this crazy stuff like, hey, you want to follow me? The problem is, yeah, I'm homeless, right? Hey, I'll follow you, but let me, uh, let me bury my father first. Let the dead bury their own dead, right? This big crowd starts to show up, and Jesus has a great idea. He says, hey, uh, so eat my flesh and drink my blood. 
<laughs> Clearly, this guy did not go to seminary. Like, you don't say stuff like that when you're trying to get big crowds. He didn't want big crowds, right? Jesus didn't want to be the heyday of the day. He wanted to reach souls to advance the kingdom of heaven. He wasn't looking to be famous. He was looking to set the captives free. Are you with me? And he didn't want to imperil his mission too soon. But it says this, he spent more time with the 12 disciples than with the entire world put together. And this is astonishing when you really think about it. At the end of the Son of God's time on earth, he had staked everything on his relationships with 12 men. Have you ever thought about that? He put all of his eggs in one basket, 12 guys. Platt continues. He says in the middle of his prayer, he even mentions that one of them, Judas, was lost. So now we're down to 11. And these 11 guys were the small group responsible for carrying on everything that Jesus had begun. Those are some big shoes to fill, aren't they? One of his final moments with them is captured in Matthew 28. The 11 gathered together, and Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, because I have this authority, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Then Platt hits it home. He says, after intentionally spending his life on earth with these 11 men, Jesus told them, now you go out and do the same with others. The mega strategy of Jesus, make disciples. And it's really interesting. I don't think this is in my notes. If it is, I'll just skip it later. But when you look at the Great Commission, many times our emphasis is on baptism. But that is not where Jesus' emphasis was. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. The King James says, teach. The original language doesn't read that way. He says, go therefore. Well, first of all, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he starts with encouragement. I've got authority, and because I have authority, I'm sending you to go and make disciples. You baptize disciples you make. That's how this process works. You disciple people, then those people end up being baptized, but you don't just leave them after that point. You don't give them a pat on the back and say, welcome to the family, and leave them in the freezer. All right? You don't do that. You keep teaching them, teaching them all things that I have commanded you, and then he closes with encouragement again. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But the main emphasis here is discipling, and the... E the Logical fruit of discipleship will be baptism. But if your goal is baptism, you're not going to be discipling. You understand the difference? If you're just trying to get people wet, you will miss the bigger point of laboring for disciples for Jesus. I'm not down on baptism. I'm a big fan of it. But the point is, your emphasis isn't growing numbers. Your emphasis is discipling souls for Jesus. Amen? The baptisms are going to take care of themselves. It's part of this natural progression. But the point is, don't get your emphasis in the wrong direction. But you're not just to make disciples. Paul gives some specific counsel to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ, and the things which you've heard from me, right, the gospel, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You're called to make disciples who will make disciples. Right, I've heard so many testimonies of this where people who are going through Bible studies are already being employed to give Bible studies to other people. And it's such a blessing because you're realizing, man, this isn't just about me learning something. I'm going to learn even more by sharing what I'm learning with somebody else. And what better way to be brought into God's church, right, into the body of believers than to be, we're told this actually, that every person is born into the kingdom a missionary, Every one of us, when we are born again, the immediate call is to take what you've learned and share it with somebody else. The woman at the well did this. She didn't go to CORE, she didn't go to seminary, she didn't go to AFCO or ARISE. She had a life course altering encounter with Jesus and she shared immediately. And she won an entire city because she realized, I cannot keep what I have experienced to myself. And the sooner you train people in this, the better things will be. Amen? And uh, we'll talk about it this afternoon, the, the, the benefit of small groups and girl groups in that regard. Here it is, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And again, and lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So you're not making disciples on your own. Some of us are kind of scared to do outreach because like no one else wants to go with me and I just can't go by myself. Well, you're actually not going by yourself. 
All of heaven is behind you in this, right? And we should certainly be encouraging more people to join us. But I'm just saying that you're not technically alone because Jesus has promised to be with us always in the endeavor of disciple making. Now, the truth about discipleship, Jesus says this in John chapter 16, verse 21, a woman when she is in labor has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. Now, I'm not a parent. I have a dog. I'm kind of practicing, and it's really hard. And if having a dog is anything like having kids, you, blessings to you guys, because it seems really hard. There was a spa, span where he was like, he was potty training, teething, and going through puberty all at once. It was like the worst experience in the world, but having kids is probably a little bit more difficult than that. But it's, it was my first taste of stop being so selfish and learn to live for somebody else, and it, I saw a lot about me. So in John chapter 16, he's saying that it's hard. Like, giving birth to a child, I hear, is quite difficult. But when you see the fruit of that labor, the pain is eclipsed by the joy over what you have received. I'm not going to sell you a bad bill of goods today, guys. Discipleship's hard. It's difficult. It is labor-intensive, but it's worth it. Did you hear me? It's worth it. And it's one of those things that is, it's, it's the greatest joy of my life to see, to labor with people and to see their eyes open to the fact that God actually loves me, that God has plans for me. Man, the Bible says this, and the Bible says, to see people's lives transformed by the power of the gospel, that's what you were made for, guys. Anytime you've ever done a good deed for somebody that had a need and you felt so good after the fact, you know why that is? Because that's striking a chord of something that's the very core of your being. That's who you're meant to be to live and to give and to serve. And when you go through this process of discipleship, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's labor intensive. You're gonna get phone calls, right? And things are, their whole world is gonna fall apart and they're gonna talk about it. But every time that you choose to live and give for this person, you're teaching them how to live and give whenever they make disciples. Are you understanding? If we only invest in people when it's convenient, we're training them to only invest in people when it's convenient and we're furthering the wrong process of discipleship. That's not how God intended for this to work, right? It's super, super important. You know, you're not, you're not you know, collecting baseball cards or building a model airplane, and I'll pick it up and set it down when I want. Discipleship is a commitment. Making disciples is a commitment, and it's a difficult and challenging one, but again, it is so rewarding. And, and heaven will testify to the fruits of those labors, but he does promise us joy in the here and now as well. So he says, they no longer remember the anguish when the child is born for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one can take from you. So here's the point, guys. True biblical discipleship is laying down your life for someone until they can stand on their own spiritually, and that takes as long as it takes. Some people, it will be a lengthy journey. Other people will catch on really quickly. That's none of your business. How long it takes is not our problem. Our responsibility is to invest. Our responsibility is to commit. And I don't even want to say responsibility. It's our privilege to invest and to commit. Amen? Right, if Jesus thought that highly of you, the least that we can do is learn to live and give for the benefit of others. And it's such a rich and precious way of doing life. And my dad did this for me. Man, I found myself in a really, I mean, uh, my parents got divorced when I was three or four. The guy my mom married after my dad, which was her third husband, got, he beat her up really bad. When I first saw her, I was like six. She was purple, she was blue, she was swollen, she wasn't the person I knew. And she told me she fell down the stairs, but even as a kid, I knew something's not right here. And I felt unsafe, and, all, and she's actually been married and divorced seven times total, and it's just all this kind of chaos as a kid. She didn't get custody, but I was around it all the time. It messed me up. It really set me up in, in a wrong direction in life because I started numbing pain and just escaping reality at a super early age. And so I wasn't in a good place in life, and when 9-11 happened, my dad woke up to the fact that the world is ending and I'm not ready. And my dad commits his life to Jesus. He wasn't like an atheist or anything. You know, we were culturally Christian, but we weren't churchgoers. I didn't know much of anything about the Bible. But my dad realized he needed something more, and he gave his life to Jesus, and I was clueless for nearly three years after that, two and a half years. My dad finds Jesus, and I'm clueless. But my dad started showing me love in a way I'd never experienced before in the summer of 2004, and I wanted what he had. 
I didn't care what it cost. I didn't care what it looked like. I wanted what he had because for the first time in my life, I felt fully known and fully loved. And everything I was running to to escape the pain, I realized that can't give me what this is giving me. I just knew. And it wasn't because I doubted that my dad loved me before, but when the love of God is in someone's heart, someone's heart and you feel that, it's different. Anyone can testify to that? When you meet people who are truly in love with Jesus, true consecrated disciples of Jesus, there's just something else in the mix that just changes your life. And I wanted what he had, but man, I, I wish I could say that my experience was God spoke and it was so, but that was not my experience. It was a long evolutionary process of refusing to die, and it was hard. But my dad never stopped loving me. He never stopped believing in me. He never gave up on me when I gave him every right to do so. And I would not be standing before you today doing what I'm doing were it not for the fact that my dad gave me such a tremendous example of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and how to make disciples of Jesus. To live and give and stay until they can stand on their own. And even then, you're friends for life. Amen? Now, I'll close with one story. Uh, one more story of my little friend, Buddy. Um, I, when I graduated from the Arise program, I don't have time to go into my testimony, but when I graduated from the Arise program, uh, things were getting really difficult for us financially. Standing for this truth cost us everything. A house was foreclosed, a car was repoed. Eventually, I went to the Arise program. I couldn't even afford to go, but a pastor bought my plane ticket. The church was sponsoring me, and I wasn't an Adventist yet. I was close, but I still had some questions. I was just not sure about some things. But I went to the Arise program, and as I'm there, my dad, things got so difficult financially, he ended up in a homeless shelter. So imagine, I'm at a Bible college, and my dad is homeless. And when I graduate from this Bible college, I can't even afford to fly home. So my pastor buys a plane ticket for me to get home, and I end up joining my dad at this homeless shelter for about three months. So just imagine, this hotshot kid who gets baptized and joins the church, goes to a Bible college, and instead of actually going and like laboring for people, God sent me to a homeless shelter, and I'm not denying the humanity of people in a homeless shelter. I'm making another point you'll see in a moment, just to make sure that's clear. Um, my responsibility while I was at this homeless shelter was to do prison correspondence and to take care of the sheep that they had. It was a rural area in Missouri. Taking care of the sheep. And of all things, we were feeding the sheep bread because... Uh, all these bakeries in St. Louis were donating all this bread. Once it wasn't, you know, healthy to eat for the people because it was molding. They put it in trash bags, and once every few weeks, they'd drive all those trash bags out to where we were, and we would feed. So we're feeding like Panera bagels and baguettes and stuff to, to sheep. No joke. So imagine the parallels, right? This, this kid who thinks he's going to change the world, Jesus gives him the Moses treatment. I'm homeless and taking care of sheep for three months before I got real people. It's like, you know, animal testing for products. That's kind of what I got because I wasn't safe yet, I guess. And so I'm taking care of these sheep, and I learned so many lessons. I don't have time to go into it. There's a message in Audioverse called, Whose Flock Is This?, where I go into all the lessons I learned. But it was so, it was such a blessing to me. Some people, when they hear I was homeless, they're like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. And I say, I'm not. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was such a blessing. And so I'm there, and I, because, like, I learned so much more about discipleship by taking care of these sheep as a homeless man than I did at Arise. And it's not because it's a bad program, but because I was in, like, the, these object lessons spoke to me in such a way that I never forgot. And we're told this in Christ's object lessons, that Jesus did that. He would use these illustrations that every time people saw those things, they would be reminded of the lessons that they were taught through that. And so I was taking care of these sheep, and they would, they would fight, unfortunately. Uh, they would fight, they'd butt heads, and one of them ended up paralyzed over this. So the next morning I'm feeding, it wasn't uncommon that they would, the moms would be so excited that there's food that they would bolt and leave their kids. So they would bolt, they would eat, and after they're done eating, they realize, oh man, where are my kids? And so they go, blah, blah, and they need to hear the babies, you know, crying across the field. They literally sound like babies crying when they do it. I can't make that sound and, and have any dignity left in public. So, um, but anyway, it's, it sounds kind of like babies crying. And they would, you know, then it would be like the, the two running through the field full of flowers and reunited and it feels so good and then the world is great and then they do it again tomorrow. It happened every day. And so we're feeding these sheep, this mom is looking for its lamb and I see out in the field, one of the guys whistles and there's a lamb sitting out in the middle of the field just kind of laying there with its kind of legs under its torso and its head sitting up. So I walk out there, I said, hey, what's going on, man? And he was so rude, he said nothing to me. Can you believe the audacity of this guy? 
Anyway, so I, 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 I try to like push him on his side, and he won't move. So I pick him up under his torso, and I raise him up, and his legs dangle like spaghetti noodles, and I knew what was going on. He was paralyzed. Now, this isn't a field in rural Missouri. There's going to be coyotes and other stuff. We can't just leave him there. So I ended up putting him in this pen they had in the horse barn there, and, ev and I, I knew what was going on at this stage. God had taught me so many lessons in a short period of time that the things that he was teaching me through the sheep were lessons that would apply to his people, and that these sheep needed to matter to me because people matter to him. And what I'm about to say next, I don't care if you think I'm crazy, but I knew this needed to matter to me, and so I went back to the little dormitory, and I got some olive oil, and I came out, and I fasted and anointed this little guy. And I prayed over him, and I came to visit him three times a day. And would just pet him. I'd remove his bedding because he'd use a bathroom all over himself. I'd remove the hay, replace it. I would hand feed him bread and I'd give him water in a water bottle and just take care of him. He had these little nubs, these little horn nubs. I don't know if you can see him up there or not. And the guys thought I was crazy and said, Why don't you just leave it to die? I said, This is none of your business. It doesn't mess up my work. There's no issues. Just leave me alone. Don't worry about it. And in the span of about four days, his front shoulder started to move. And as I kept praying and kept investing in him, eventually he got mobility in all four of his limbs. And unfortunately at this time, my dad and I, he eventually went, got moved to a different homeless shelter a little bit further out west than where I was. But we found out that my aunt had stage four lung cancer. She wasn't a smoker, but had stage four cancer. It wasn't looking good. And so we were trying to get back to Illinois where my family was in southern Illinois. And so I'm going to have to leave. I'm going to get on a train and go back to Illinois. But I'm just praying, like, God, please help Buddy. God, please help Buddy. Help him to get better. Help him to get better. And I would pick him up, and he'd put his four legs out, and I would start to release his weight onto his legs. i kind of release his torso onto his legs. And he would hold his weight for just a little bit, and then his legs would start to shake, and then he would collapse. He was so close to standing on his own, but he just couldn't quite do it. And I was praying passionately. I mean, maybe not like Daniel and Daniel 9, but I was praying passionately, God, please help Buddy. Help him to get better. And the last day, the day I'm getting in a car to go to the train station and then take a bus the rest of the way, I give one last chance. We'd move the sheep to the other side of the highway, but he was in a doghouse now instead of a cage. He was close, and I just said, God, please help Buddy. And one last time, I tried. And he releases his four legs, puts his legs out, I start to release his weight on his legs, and he holds, and then he starts to shake, and he collapses onto his legs. He was so close to standing on his own, and I had to go. So I asked one of the other guys, most of the guys didn't even care about the sheep. They'd throw bread and hit him in the head and stuff. They didn't care, but one guy did. And so I said, Dave, would you take care of Buddy? So I leave. And about ten, so in about 10 days, but he had gained mobility in all four of his legs. I'm gone for like a week and a half to two weeks, and I text the guy who was leading the, the homeless shelter there in that particular location. And I said, hey, how's Buddy doing? And the response I got was, sorry, Buddy died. And I immediately knew why. I left. I left him. I left him before he could stand on his own. And it taught me a lesson that I have never forgotten in discipleship. People matter to God. And when God gives you the privilege of laboring for his children, that should matter to you. It's not a hobby that you pick up and set down at, at your own will. This should really matter to you. You need to be committed to this, and it's going to take time. And to keep laboring until they can stand on their own. And I, I made a vow, I would never let that happen ever again. That's never going to happen again. Guys, when we're laboring for people, they need us. And I don't mean this independency sense. We need to point them to Jesus. He's their true source of strength. But we are told in Galatians 6, 2, that we're to, to bear one another's burdens. And the process of discipleship is a process. And I hope you understand this, that when you're beginning this process, these people really need to... If God can cause me to care for a dumb animal, certainly, somehow, some way, by His grace, He can give me genuine compassion and care for human beings. Are you with me? God can do that. And He has done that in my own personal life, and He can do the same for you. And if you recognize today, 
you know, I really don't care that much about people. It doesn't really matter to me where people are going. I got my thing and I'm pretty good. I would implore you on behalf of Christ this morning, ask God to change that. God, I recognize something's wrong here. If all I'm concerned about is my kingdom, my empire, my comfort, and so forth, something's wrong. If I find myself coming to church and being upset because they're not singing my songs or preaching my sermons or someone sitting in my seat, you are not coming to worship God. You're coming to worship you. And God deserves better than that. And He hasn't just called us to come and worship Him. He's also called us as an act of worship to serve His children. Are you with me? And I assure you, this will make you better human beings, it will make you better husbands, better wives, better fathers, better mothers, better brothers and sisters and mentors and leaders when you come to see your fellow human beings as God sees them and ask Him to do that. God, awaken me to the importance of discipleship. Awaken me to the value of a human soul. Do you think He'd answer that prayer today? You better believe it. God in heaven, we have a need. We recognize that we do not have the compassion and love and concern for our fellow human beings as you do. And we need you to change that. God, I'm asking that you would remove, as you promised in Ezekiel 36, that you'd remove the heart of stone from our flesh and that you would give us a heart of flesh. That you would put your spirit within us and that you would cause us to walk in your statutes and your judgments to do them. God, we need transformation. We need compassion. And we need a willingness to commit to the well-being of our fellow human beings. And Lord, I pray that you would do something in this community as a result of what we're learning right now that would awaken us as we're doing this initiative of each one bring one. I pray that we would recognize that, man, these co-workers I've been overlooking for 10 years, they don't know what I know. They don't have what I have. And God, I'm sorry. And I want that to change today. Show me how to be a loving and lovable Christian in their midst. Show me how to make a connection with them. Show me how, enable me to desire their well-being and happiness above my own. How do I build those bridges, Lord? How do I see the value in these people that you see? And Lord, I fully believe that if we prayed that before we went to work each day, not only would this church be full, your heart would be full. God, give us your heart, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us for our closing hymn, He Leadeth Me.
God in heaven, you've challenged us this weekend, and I just pray that you would keep your promise, that you who've begun a good work in us, that you would complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Make us more like you. Make us more compassionate and other-centered. And I pray that many seeds would die today so that we can bear much fruit for your glory. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.